only for our um, meeting today. Today is also our very first time that we'll be having a video recording of this teaching and we want to trust God that the recording will turn out as we are hoping that it will turn out. Amen. Amen. Um, okay, now, first of all, Happy New Year to you and to all those who may be viewing this video in the days to come. Um, this is the Reformed Bible Study holding at the University of Ibarra, and um, we have the encouragement of the Bible Study. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have been uh, looking at um, the book of Ephesians, chapter one, uh, for the past like six weeks now. We've been considering Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 3. So this morning we're actually going to be starting with verse 4. And uh, today's sermon I want to title it, uh, God Who Chooses. God Who Chooses. I was very careful not to just stumble into this sermon because I felt that it had a lot in it that um, uh, we, we, we could rush over. That's why I didn't um, tackle it before we went for the Christmas break. But I'm trusting God that we can do it today and at least introduce something about it. There's a mighty doctrine that is within this verse, and um, I, I, I believe God that um, it, we will be able to do justice in discussing it. Again, what we do at the Reform Bible Studies is that we try as much as possible not to teach topically, we teach expositionally. That is, we try to remain with the Word of God. We try to allow the scriptures to direct what exactly we are teaching. Okay, so verse 4, but to even give it the context, we want to look at from verse 3 to verse 4 so that we can see the context in which uh, God is doing his choosing. Verse 3 Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. In Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we may be holy and blameless before Him. Before we went on the break, uh, we looked at Ephesians chapter one verse three, and we saw a very glorious doctrine. That we saw that the Christian blessing is actually a spiritual blessing. We, we try as much as possible to establish that before we, we, we left that it is a spiritual blessing. It is not so much a physical blessing, even though we are confident that if we pursue the spiritual blessings, if we pursue the things that God wants us to pursue, if we pursue the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that we trust that physical blessing will also come along with them. But the Christian blessing is actually spiritual. So, even as Paul was concluding that verse, he said, with every spiritual blessing in every place, it seemed as if the very next next line or verse that we were going to begin to consider was the element of what these spiritual blessings will be. So we saw him say that even as he chose us in him, that is, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's what we want to look at, this concept of God chosen this concept of God's choosing. Before I start, I want to uh, give us this story. It's a popular story. Rather, would have come across it of the lion. Have you heard of the lion's prayer before? The lion, the lion's only prayer in the morning is, God, show me what I should eat or the animal that I should eat this morning and leave the rest to me. That is the lion's prayer. So just show it to me and I will do every other thing. Okay? That means that the lion is... Uh, I mean, to say it's an Armenian. Okay? He has a way of uh, God, do your part and I'll do my part. Okay? But the real Christian is not like that. The Christian is totally dependent on God. The Christian says, God, show me the food that we eat and also provide it for me. Okay? So we're going to actually begin to look at something. Because a Christian that can pray like that believes in one thing and believes in the God, in the sovereignty of God. So there is an element or a dimension of the sovereignty of God that we're looking at today, which is the God who chooses, the God who chooses. In fact, before we even start to look at this concept of God who chooses, remember also that before we even began to look at Ephesians 1, 
of 1, 1, 3. We had looked at Ephesians 1 from 3 to 14, and we saw that the whole statement in the original Greek was one sentence. Okay, and these three sentences were actually, I mean, these sentences were actually looked at the whole concept of salvation. And not just the whole concept of salvation, but the fact that God the Father does something in salvation, God the Son does something in salvation, and God the Holy Spirit does something in salvation. So the very first thing we want to look at today is what aspect of salvation God the Father is doing. And that fear of it, of course, like we have said, is uh, the God who chooses. The sovereignty of God, the God who chooses. Now, if we're going to deal or we're going to do justice with someone like this, we want to look at what exactly is the problem. The problem is this, is the fact that in today's consideration of salvation, we're not saying that people are not saved, but the fact that there are so many people who think that salvation is man-centered. There's this tendency to want to uh, make salvation center of man. So we begin to hear things like people giving their lives to Christ. We begin to hear things like um, I'm, 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 I'm making a confession, a prayer, a sinner's prayer, and so on and so forth. Much of what salvation is today is centered around the human being. But when you look at Ephesians 1, chapter 3, verse 3 to 14, we realize that there was no human being there. Instead, the human being was only the beneficiary. Every other thing that was done as far as the salvation of man was concerned of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So when we begin to look at when God, who chooses, how does God choose? Some people say that the sovereignty of God in the salvation of a human being is not God choosing people before the foundation of the earth. Rather, they say that it is God possessing a foreknowledge. Foreknowledge is this. God is outside time. And is able to look through the history of time and then see that okay, certain people are going to actually have a certain kind of penitent power and they're going to uh, be uh, uh, have a kind of um, attitude to the gospel, and then he's going to give them or choose them to salvation. That he had the full knowledge of all people who will be before he does that. But then, if we're going to actually, if this concept is true. Then, Romans chapter 9 is not correct because we see that. Uh, Paul was saying that in Romans chapter 9, he said that before Esau and Jacob did anything good or bad, God had already chosen them. Because unfortunately, I don't have that word readily before me here, but I think we'll still come, come across it in this passage, okay, in the summer, okay? He, before they did anything good or bad, God had already chosen them to salvation. That means that. Salvation is not just, I mean, sorry, God's sovereignty in salvation is a lot more than foreknowledge. And so we're going to see a lot of things concerning it. Now, salvation is a spiritual blessing we've talked about. It's God's spiritual blessings to us, and it begins and ends with God. The works of God the Father in the process of salvation is the fitting place to begin to discuss the salvation of human beings at all times. Okay, so we have three persons in, 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 in one God, the one in the, in the Christian God. Okay, and God the Father uh, work in salvation, as we're going to see into this summer, is his choosing human being. But we're going to have to begin with God the Father first. We must comprehend the biblical truth that God chooses some men to salvation from the foundation of the earth. This is a doctrine that is taught throughout scriptures. Now, um, I would be hesitant to say that, except people believe in the sovereignty of God, they are not saved. I would hesitate to say that. Okay? I personally do not think that I have seen evidence in it in scriptures. I think I have seen a lot of people who still hold to the uh, Lordship of Jesus Christ, who still hold to very mighty doctrines of the scriptures, but who, in a sense, do not believe in the sovereignty of God. So I'm not going to. Uh, Press that. But at the same time, I think that if people comprehend this whole issue of God being able to choose men or save men, in fact, choose men from the foundation of it, if we're able to understand that doctrine of the sovereignty of God, it gives our understanding of the, the doctrine of salvation some, um, how do I call it, some, um, some flesh. 
In fact, I think that, I, 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 not I think, I have seen people who have confessed that they became Christians when they understood the sovereignty of God, the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, especially that aspect of God choosing men from the foundation of the earth. Okay? So that's, that, I, I, that's one of the reasons why it's important, because number one, it's a doctrine that is put aside. It already feels that because it's very controversial, it shouldn't be taught in the church. Unfortunately, we have no choice now. Because we have come across it in our uh, say, expositional, expositional preaching. Okay? Now, God's relations to the patriarch of Israel, and with Israel itself, I mean, it's described in the Old Testament as one of choice. So, if we're going to even start to talk about God who chooses, first of all, we want to look at what happened in the Old Testament. And we see abundant evidence to show that in the Old Testament, God. I mean, in fact, God elected a people to himself in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 17 to 19, it reads that God chose Abraham in three sisters. For I have chosen him, that is Abraham, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. So we see here that God chose Abraham. Why? Because Abraham was going to do certain things. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 37, the Bible says, because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them, and he personally brought you from Egypt by his great power. I want our brother, um, uh, brother, what's my brother's name? I want you to open to Isaiah chapter 41 verse 8. I will read Deuteronomy. Because I think it's important that I should have written it out here. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 to 7. Okay? Deuteronomy. It says, For thou art holy, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor chose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. So we see here Moses telling the children of Israel that God had chosen them. Can we see Isaiah 41 verse 8? Isaiah 41 verse 8. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, exactly. the seed of Israel. So the Bible says there that Jacob is somebody whom God has chosen. And we see the same thing in Psalm 33, verse 12, and Psalm 47, verse 4. The concept of God's elect, in fact, the concept of Israel being God's elect, the fact that God had chosen a people out of the whole nations of the world, is a concept that is clearly and uh, clearly written or clearly exemplified in the Old Testament. And it's the same thing that is brought into the New Testament so that Paul can now say that God chose a people from where? From the foundation of the earth. Now, I, I'll just continue. Some describe God choosing people as based on his foreknowledge of what they will do. But the scripture speaks for the wise. We see that God chooses from the foundation of the earth. What does this from the foundation of the earth mean? Okay, it's simply this, okay, you want to start to build, all right, what do you do first? You lay the foundation first, okay? So it's from the beginning, from the start. It's, it's, it's and before we could, God even um, um, started the creation of the world, God had said that certain people were going to be his people. First of all, he said that Abraham, he had elected, that Abraham was going to be the means with which he was going to choose a nation out of himself. After Abraham, the seeds of Abraham, Israel, were going to be his elect people. And following that, he had also designed that through Abraham, through Israel, Jesus Christ was going to come into the world so that the whole world, sorry, those who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will come soon. That action took place from where? From the, from, from the beginning of the world, just before the world was started. Uh, let, let me read uh, Romans chapter 9. I think that that's that place that uh, I was quoting earlier on. Romans chapter 9, verse 10 to 13. The Greeks and I quote 10 to 13. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, 
neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, none of what but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the what? The younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, and Israel I have what? Hated. So God made the decision long before anything was done. So all knowledge is not God's chosen. God's chosen is way beyond all knowledge. God's choice of men in sorry, God's God's choice God's choice of men is the foundation on which the doctrine of election stands. So if we're talking about election, we're talking about the fact that God has chosen the people. The New Testament is also replete with scriptures that point to the fact that God chooses men unto salvation. So I have a couple of them here, let me read. Mark chapter 13, verse 20. Unless the Lord had shortened those things, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he, that is the Lord, has shortened those things. This is Jesus speaking on the uh, mount, I believe, of, um, of, of Moriah or something. Luke chapter 6, verse 13 says, And when they came, he called his disciples to him, and chose twelve of them, whom he also named what? Apostles. 10 35, please just take notes if you need to to me. Whom he also named apostles. We see in John 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, Jesus saying, but I did one. I chose you, and I appointed you that you will go and bear fruit, that your fruit will remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of this world to shame those who are who are strong. So we see those scriptures. There are many others that I listed here that we won't be able to look at. Now, if we would understand the whole plan of salvation, if we would be able to make the gospel the center of our lives, if the gospel would become a great thing of comfort to us, if we would discover the great spiritual blessing that God the Father has brought in saving sinners like us, if we comprehend all of these things, then we must understand that God chooses men and we must settle this argument forever in our mind. God chooses men and we must. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a debate that has gone on for so long. I can't even start because of our time. Okay? But we must. God chooses men. God chose some men from what? From the foundation of the earth. That is what scripture says. And it must somehow enter into our theology. If we're not teaching it, then our theology is defective. The doctrine of election is what separates Reformed theology from every other theology in the world. And there's nothing more true than that. I think one of the greatest disservice to Christianity in this country was that those who taught us the Christian faith, a lot of them were Armenians. And they tell you, you know, Christianity came to Nigeria in the mid uh, 19th century, and that was the time when there was a resurgence of Armenianism. Uh, Armenianism and um, well, the liberal theology. But a lot of those missionaries that came to Nigeria, a lot of them subscribed to either full Armenianism or part. Okay, and it's going to be part of something that I'm going to do along my thesis for my final year project. Okay, which I'm going, to, I'm going to trace the theology of those original men. What did they teach? Okay, some of the things I've discovered is that a lot of them taught Arminianism. All right, and Arminianism basically rejects this idea, even though, of course, in 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 in, in, um, in substance, it may say so, not substance, it may claim. To believe in the sovereignty of God, but in reality, in substance, it rejects it. Okay? Whether we're talking about Islam, you know, all of them, they reject the whole uh, idea that God, there is a God who will choose certain men. Because you see, if you say that God has chosen certain men to salvation, then what happened to the rest? That means he's going to allow the rest to go to hell. Is that not so? Yeah, that doctrine is actually called the doctrine of reprobation. I don't have the time to look into it presently. Now, this is what the fathers have taught throughout church history. So, we're not alone. We've seen God choosing men in the Old Testament. We've seen God choosing men in the New Testament. And now we're going to see God choosing men even in church history. This is what the fathers taught in church history. And if we preach the gospel today, we must not teach anything less. Augustine. Augustine said this Thou didst seek us when we sought thee not. Didst thou didst seek us indeed that we might seek thee. 
Man is not converted because he wills to be, but he wills to be converted because he is ordained to conversion by election. God chooses us not because we believe, but that we may believe. Now, in the days of Augustine, Augustine uh, propounded uh, this doctrine and uh, believed in the sovereignty of God in the salvation of sinners. But there was another doctrine called Pelagianism. Okay, Pelagianism rejected it. In fact, Pelagianism was full blown heresy. Okay, it rejected the idea. In fact, believed that man was not born with original sin. Okay, and that uh, everybody can indeed uh, attain salvation through their effort. This was C.H. Spontan said. It is one of the axioms of theology that if a man be lost, that if a man be lost, God must not be blamed for it. And it is also an axiom of theology that if a man be saved, God must have all the glory for it. Okay? So if we are saved at all today, we give all the glory to God. But if a man is done, then we will see next week the place of damnation and how men come to damnation. Okay, Thomas Manton said this: election is ascribed to God the Father, sanctification and sanctification to the Holy Spirit, and reconciliation and redemption to Jesus Christ. The Son cannot die for whom the Father never elected, and the Spirit will never sanctify them whom the Father had not elected, nor the Son had not redeemed. Carl F. H. Henry says this at the heart of election, sorry, at the heart of the election doctrine trusts God's freedom. <coughs> Joseph Allen said this you begin at the wrong end if you dispute your election. You begin at the wrong end if, end if you dispute if you first dispute your election. Prove your conversion and then never doubt your election. Wayne Gruden said this. Election is an act of God before creation in which he chooses some people to be saved, not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign good pleasure. Praise the Lord. Now please let us take note of what I'm trying to say here. I'm talking about the whole gamut of uh, the doctrine of salvation, which Ephesians 1, chapter verse 3 to 14 was talking about. Now, we introduced verse 3 by saying that God had given us what? Spiritual blessing. The very first spiritual blessing we come across is what? God choosing certain people from where? From the foundation of the earth. And I dare to say that this is what Reformed theology is all about. The doctrine that God chooses men to salvation is the Reformed anthem. Praise the Lord. The doctrine that God chooses some men to salvation is the I call it Reformed anthem because that is what most Reformed people are agreed on. Unfortunately, today we find a lot of people say that certain people are not Reformed because they are not doing this, they are not doing that. But personally, I think that as many people who subscribe to the doctrine of the sovereignty of God in salvation of men, all of such people are performed people, at least as long as they subscribe to the five Sulak. Okay? Now, the doctrine of election is a source of comfort for God's people because we must rest our salvation on one greater than ourselves. Who is what? Who is God? Because when push comes to show, remember when we were talking about spiritual blessing, you were asked and you said, I want this one type of spiritual blessing. And I said, well, I'm showing some salvation. The truth of the matter is that what, one of the things that has shot our salvation is simply this, that God beyond what we have done or what we could ever do has chosen us beyond ourselves to salvation. So if God has elected a people to himself, all by himself, beyond the effort of men, 